Hello, my name is Danny Nolan and I'm the Director of Chassis Sim Technologies and welcome to this latest episode of Dan's Vehicle Dynamics Corner Live and today ladies and gentlemen I want to talk about a very very important topic when it comes to race car handling and that is the stability index. Now the numbers of the stability index where it comes from I go into incredible detail about this in chapter 5 of my book The Dynamics of the Race Car. I also um, have dedicated a number of my race car engineering articles to this. I've also dedicated a number of my YouTube um, videos to this. That being said, some colleagues of mine gave me the heads up about some misconceptions about the stability index, um, some doubts about the numbers, where things fit in, etc, etc. So today, ladies and gentlemen, what I want to talk to you about is the stability index clarification. So we can put um, these matters um, to rest. So. What we're gonna to do today is I'm just gonna walk you through a very quick introduction um, to um, the stability index, and we'll go through some of these specifics so that you can understand a little bit more about, in particular, about where the numbers come from and um, how you derive them. So, to kick off the discussion, I really wanna start it at some mathematical fundamentals and um, uh, give me a little bit of rope here. So what we've got here is that we've got our generic Y versus X graph. Now. The derivative of this, and we're going to get back to this in a minute, so bear with me, is dy dx is the limit as delta x approaches zero of delta y over delta x vis-a-vis -vis the slope as that delta x approaches zero. Again, we'll talk about um, the significance of this um, uh, momentarily, but I want you to just take that for the time being and I want you to park it. Now, in terms of a quick elevator speech of what drives the stability index on the from this angle. So what we've got here is that we've got a very simple bicycle model of a, um, a bicycle model of a race car. And we just and the only reason we've got a bicycle model is just simply for simplicity. So what we've got here is that we've got our rear lateral forces, we've got our front lateral forces. Now, here's the now, ladies and gentlemen, what the stability index is measuring is the normalized static margin. That is the moment arm between the center of the lateral forces and the center of the longitudinal forces. And the stability index is basically your static margin divided by the wheelbase. That's all it is. Now, let me make one point very, very clear. Uh, let me make one point very, very clear. One of the things that we in the automotive community, and particularly us in the motorsport community, have done an absolutely atrocious job of is that we've been incredibly imprecise in how we describe vehicle handling. And particularly in motor racing, you know, we'll throw around terms like understeer, she's pushing, or oversteer, she's loose, and we'll throw them around like frisbees. And the problem with that is not to downgrade the importance of these terms, but the problem is, for example, and um, uh, one of my junior engineers made this point really, uh, made this point very, very well. If you take a look at any um, situation uh, uh, that if you take a look at any dirt lake model race, you take a look at any sprint car race, you will see the cars going sideways, but you'll see them going sideways in a stable fashion. Statically, yeah, in the traditional sense, yes, they are oversteering, but they're actually stable. And make no mistake, there's a huge distinction between those two. Now, the thing about the stability index is the stability index is when we talk about understeer, oversteer, the car's pushing, she's loose. That's a consequence. What the stability index does is it tells you what drives this in um, the uh, what drives this in the first place. Now, the actual magnitudes of the numbers of what to look for, I actually covered in depth in a very very recent um, dance vehicle dynamics um, uh, tutorial slash um, chassis sim tutorial. So I'd really refer you to that, and you've actually got some uh, video of driver in the loop so that you can contrast that um, with, but. The formulation of the stability index, and there's a rough approximation, is A, which is the moment arm between front axle and center of gravity, times CF minus B, which is the moment arm between the rear axle and um, the center of gravity. Actually, my apologies, I just made a little bit of an error in, um, uh, uh, in that diagram there, my apologies, so, cor uh, so duly corrected. Um, and so that is our moment arm between B and the center of gravity, and that's B times CR divided by CT times the wheelbase, and CT is just simply CF plus CR, and minus 
a squared CF plus B squared on CR divided by VX times CT on the wheelbase. That's your yaw damping term. Now, let's now talk about the details of what describes the CF term and the CR terms. Because in uh, 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 because the elevator speech, all that CF and CR is, is CF is the slope of your lateral force versus the slip angle for the front. CR is your lateral slope of uh, is your lateral slope of your lateral forces of the rear um, divided by the slip angle. So these are the um, this gradient here. That's what we're measuring. So that's why I wanted you to park that. But again, still park that for the time being because we'll talk about the significance of this momentarily. So let's talk about the significance of what these numbers actually mean. Now, what I want you to do is now that we're going to talk about this. Remember the last dance vehicle dynamics corner we did about time model approximations, and in particular how we spoke about a really good time model approximation is your lateral force times your normalized function CF of alpha times your traction circle radius. This is now where this is going to come into effect. So our CF term is DCF on D alpha times the traction circle radius of the left front plus the traction circle radius of the left rear. And to keep the discussion simple, I'm just going to assume symmetry um, in the tire models. Now, the asymmetric case is simply a superset of this. I'm just simply assuming the symmetrical case because it's just going to make the numbers easier. Now, our CR term is DCR on D alpha times the traction circle radius of the rear left plus the traction circle radius of um, the rear right. And what we've got here, L1 and T1, L1 is your vertical load on the uh, front left. T1 is your idealized high temperature on the front left. Now, we could break that down into core temperatures, different surface temperatures, but I'm just doing that for ease of illustration. Um, ditto L and ditto for L2, which is um, your, uh, uh, which is your um, front to right. L3, which is your rear left. And L4, that is your right rear. Now. Here's where it gets interesting. Let's talk about what drives this DCFD alpha term. What drives this DCFD alpha term? If you remember from the last video we did with our normalized, for, uh, with our normalized slip function, we've got CF that's normalized between minus one and plus one, and I'm, just, uh, and I'm just illustrating the symmetrical case just to make the diagrams a bit easier. And so we go up like this, we go down like that. That DCFD alpha, is the gradient of this slope, uh, is the gradient of this slope at the particular slip angle that the tire finds itself at. Now, I go into depth about that derivation in um, the dynamics of the race car, but really, where I really want to ram this point home, and really, and this is where a lot of misunderstandings start to crop in, and the fact that they see DCFD alpha and they go, what's that? And really, all that DCFD alpha is, and DCRD alpha is, is the, um, is the gradient of your normalized slip curve at that particular slip angle that the tire finds itself in. That's it. It's as simple as that. Now, in terms of where the numbers for this lie, it depends on the slip curve you're going to use. So for example, if you use the um, slip curve that's basically in the default chassis in tire models, these numbers will go from about 14.3, give about 14.3 for a typical peak slip angle of about six degrees. Um, and that, and, and let me make one point very, very clear. We are measuring this slope as a, fun, uh, as a function of radiant. I cannot make that point clearly enough because if you try and do it in degrees, the numbers just simply don't work. They, be, they become nonsensical, but if you measure them in radians, they make a lot more sense. So. Typically, for the normalized chassis of slip curve and where your peak slip angle is about six degrees, the numbers go from about 14.3 down here to when, uh, to, uh, to about five, five and a half degrees. You're typically talking about two to three. That's going to be, that's going to be really significant, and I'm going to get back to that shortly. For a typical Pajeka curve, because the Pajeka curve is a lot more pronounced in its initial slope, you're talking numbers between about, your typical start numbers for a typical stall angle about four and a half degrees, um, uh, give or take, is about 30 at the front. But even as you're getting to about half a degree away from your peak slip curve, like the, uh, those slopes are still about one. Right, let's now talk about the magnitudes of these numbers. Now, 
Rough, uh, now, rough rules of thumb, these will be dependent time from time. But let me just talk about some GT3 numbers just to make things a little bit easier. If we talk about some typical GT3 numbers, these numbers here are typically in the order of about, a, uh, uh, in the order of about, uh, uh, anywhere about between about 1200 to 1300 kilo, uh, kilograms force, or about 12 to 1300 newtons at the outside front. The rears are about 16,000 newtons, give or take at the right front. And that's obviously going to depend on your weight distribution. For cars with a 50 50 weight distribution, they'll be split pretty much 10,000 newtons straight down the line. For your cars that are more mid engine, like your Ferraris and your Lambos, they're the sort of numbers I just talked about, with typically numbers of about 10,000 the front, 16,000 the rear, or there, or, uh, there, or, um, there, or thereabouts. So they're basically the sort of numbers that will sort of give uh, that will sort of give you that. Now, one misconception I want to hit bang on the head: these numbers here, the, the stability index is a living, breathing thing. If we take a look at this formula, that's the load on the outside tire, that's the load on the inside tire. So these numbers are going to change as you start doing load transfer. So when we start talking about the formulation of the stability index as you start transferring load because this is uh, 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 because this is part of your formulation here depending on where you are on this slip curve which uh, depending where you are on our traction circle radius versus load curve that will depend the numbers that go into here so this will change with um, uh, lo uh, with uh, load uh, transfer now I've been a little bit naughty in some of my race car engineering um, articles and in um, some of my YouTube tutorials and the fact that I've made a little bit of an omission here. And the only reason I've made that omission is to make things a little bit easier for everyone to get their heads around. Um, I don't make that omission in um, chapter five of my book, The Dynamics of the Race Car. And what we're missing here is the omission is plus FX front, which is the sum of our longitudinal forces at the front plus fx rear. Right, let's now talk about the significance of that term. Okie dokie. Now, for typical road racing applications, so we're talking, um, time, uh, we're talking tarmac racing, let's go through the numbers. And again, let's take a look at a GT3 car pulling about, um, uh, 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 pulling about 2G with a mid-corner speed of about 200 kilometers per hour. Now, Typically, and let's and, and we'll make the discussion just a little bit easier in the fact that we're going to assume rear wheel drive just to make the numbers a little bit easier. Now, as we start to get, and let's assume, and I'm going to be a, I'm going to go to a little bit of a worst case scenario here. Let's go up to where the pe uh, peaks of Bangle is, so about half a degree away from our rear peak, uh, uh, from where our peak rear slap angle is. So typically. Our, DS, our DSF DR at that point is about one, and you can easily do that by plotting up a Jacob curve in Excel and doing a curve fit to make sure you change the slip angles from degrees to radians. Now, here to quote Captain Jack Sparrow, here's where things get really, really interesting. So, that number's about one. Your total number here is about 16,000 give uh, is about 16,000 newtons give or take. Let's talk about this number here. This number here, typically a GT3 car runs a CDA of about um, uh, 1.2. So, and your uh, and if you take a look at the drag force that you're going to have to run, now you will assume a, um, a, a peak slip angle of about um, six degrees just to keep the discussion simple. So it's about a radius of about 0.1047. We'll round it down to 0.1 just to make the number simple. So we're looking at a total drag force of about 4,000. So in this case, even right at the limit, by far and away, the dominant term is this one. And where things get really interesting, if you just pop down a further half a degree down, um, a, a, a half a degree down the limit, that DCR, uh, that DCR the upper term goes back to five to six to 10, which totally swamps that term there. Now, there is an exception about that, and I'm going to talk about that momentarily, and I really wanted to ram that point home. Another question that got asked, and I thought it was a very good question, is what happens to the stability index as the car get, gets closer to the limit? 
That's a, and particularly when we've got a situation where we've got the neutral case, that is, the front stop angles are exactly the same as the rear stop angle at the limit. Now, if that's the case then, remember our definition of the derivative? This now becomes a limit calculation. Now, this is where things get ever, ever so interesting. And here's why things get ever so interesting. If we were to run the car in a neutral car right up to the limit, where all of a sudden our slopes are very, very small, what we've got is that we've got a car that, yes, is statically static, that is statically neutral, but it can go any, uh, but it can, uh, that it can flip, it can show, it can start to show some very Jekyll and Hyde properties. This is why, ladies and gentlemen, over racing is a whole dis is a whole necessary discipline unto itself. Anyone who, uh, and in particular in European, uh, in European motorsport, there's this vision that oval racing is easy because all you're doing is turning left. That is a total nonsense. And, the, and one of the key reasons it's a total nonsense is as you start to get close to here, as those limits start, as those slopes start to get very, very small here, this is where you need to be right, uh, this is where you need to be right on. And indeed, in oval racing, um, even though we like to think that we are going to go right up to the uh, right up to the peak's limit uh, to the peak slip limit, in reality, you never ever quite get there. You know, so so for example, if you're talking a peak slip angle of about six degrees in an oval racing environment, you might be looking at about five and a half, or about maybe up to about ninety percent. The really good drivers can get up to about ninety-five percent. Beyond that, you're re uh, um, you're really taking your life in your hands now. One, the other comment that I also want to, uh, wanted to point is when you've got a situation where you are clear understeer and oversteer. Where you've got clear understeer and oversteer, and let's just assume, assume for the sake of the argument that you've got, you've got the understeering case where the CF, where the DS, where the DCF, the alpha term goes to zero. In this case, you've still got the CR, the alpha term um, uh, as, a, uh, as a significant number. So that will become your, do uh, your that will become the dominant stability um, uh, the, do the dominant stability index term. But what's actually quite interesting is that's great on paper, but in reality, when you're on the racetrack, what happens is that in addition to cornering, you've also got to uh, you've also got to apply power so that you can be balanced through the corner as well. So the notion that you will achieve the perfect six degrees worth of slip. It's basically, uh, let, let's just say it's an idealized case that you're never going to, um, uh, it's an idealized case that you're never going to get there. Now, let's now talk about when the FX and FX are, um, the FX front and the FXR terms now really dominate um, the stability index. And where they dominate the stability index, um, ladies and gentlemen, is when you start running on dirt and ice. Because what happens when you start running on dirt and ice is this slip curve here now becomes a very, very different animal. And for that, I would refer you to my race car engineering article and my Shastun YouTube tutorial about race and rally car dynamics. At this point, you're now dealing with this situation. So here, as you get up to the post fall curve, pretty much the gradient here becomes zero. And in that case, the FX front and the FX rear terms completely and uh, 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 are now the dominant terms um, in, the, uh, in the stability index. It, and for that reason, it's no accident that um, board rally teams spend an awful lot of effort figuring out how to split their torque distributions front to rear. It's also a very, very big reason that um, uh, you'll have um, things like sprint car setups, dirt late model setups, spend an awful lot of time figuring out how they do their power on. It's why you see them going, so the reason you see them going sideways is that all of a sudden, the FXR terms become a very, very big term in terms of actually getting you, uh, in terms of getting you around the corner. So, on that note, let me conclude this tutorial. I hope you've enjoyed it, I uh, hope you've enjoyed it as much as I've enjoyed presenting it. And I hope it's laid a little bit of these misconceptions to rest. But look, for the details, um, I'd refer you to my tutorials on the stability index um, on the Chassis YouTube channel. And if you really want the mathematical derivation of this, um, basically it's half of chapter five of my book, The Dynamics of the Race Car, and that was lifted straight from my master's thesis. So um, uh, for those um, who are particularly intellectual fussy, yes, to say that has been peer reviewed is a bit of an understatement. 
So at that point, let me conclude the tutorial and we will catch you in the next episode of Dan's Vehicle Dynamics Corner.